Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, we're so grateful that you were watching this video with us. I can't believe I'm saying that. I think Clay and I both want to acknowledge this, the general weirdness of this situation. We're still watching and participating in worship services uh, on our TVs, on our computers, on our phones. I'm just, I can't believe that I'm not beginning the service by waiting for everybody to grab their cup of coffee and sit down. And so we need to acknowledge the weirdness of what we're entering into, the fact that I'm wearing a jacket, and you'll see Clay wearing a jacket in a little bit. But this is a morning where we get to celebrate together, and there is nothing that is going to stop us from doing that. There's nothing that's going to stop us from celebrating God and celebrating the resurrection of His Son this Easter morning. So let me just say, Happy Easter. And one of my favorite liturgical responses, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We'll begin this morning uh, with our call to worship, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And later on in the service, we will hear uh, from Pastor Clay, who will be going through Mark and looking at the resurrection story there. So we are going to begin with this call to worship in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this Easter morning. Lord, we thank you that though we cannot be together in person, we can still be together and worshiping you across this city and across this country and throughout this world, worshiping you, celebrating the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Would your spirit be at work and moving in us wherever we are, however we are, would you be working in us this morning? Speak through clay, speak through this service, the reading of your word, lifting our voices to you and use it for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please join us in singing in response this morning, the song, In Christ Alone.
Our confession of faith this morning is uh, another Heidelberg Catechism question, and it asks this. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death, so that he could make us share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are raised up to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is to us a sure pledge of our glorious resurrection. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll take the next few moments and silently confess our sins before God. And as we say each week, remember that you are confessing to a God who hears your sins. And as we'll hear about later this morning, has done the only thing possible to free us from our sins and bring us into right relationship with him. So take this moment, confess your sins silently before God. Amen. Hear now this assurance of pardon from Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone connected to Good Shepherd. Whether you come here usually on Sunday mornings or if you're connected to us through the internet this morning, we are glad that you would gather together with us uh, at your homes and your apartments, wherever you are, to worship the risen Christ with us this morning. It's the morning that we've been yearning for, longing for, looking forward to, and now we get to celebrate that He is risen indeed. This morning we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 16. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. But before we get there, I want to mention a few things, kind of lay some groundwork to hopefully prepare our hearts to hear the incredible good news of Easter. I think there's three general things that all of us have been going through as we've been witnessing and participating in this whole global and national uh, situation of the COVID crisis. And the first thing is the pressing urgency of everything that's going on. It's the urgency of, of bringing into our vision, into our acknowledgement, into our experience once again, something that we tend to try to keep at bay, try to keep in the peripheral of our mind. We don't even want to think about it. We try to avoid it at all costs, but it's the reality of death. We entered into that reality deeply uh, on Friday for our Good Friday service, but it's the reality that COVID confronts all of us with our mortality. As we see things globally, uh, we hear that COVID presents us with about a 1% mortality rate. It doesn't sound like much, but when you think of in this nation, hundreds of millions of people and around the world, literally billions of people, that number could get really high. So for many of us, maybe for the first time in a long time, we have thought about our own mortality. And so it's pressed up against us, a, a reality that we're not so used to having to confront. But not only that, with that has come a new urgency as well. With that mortality rate, doctors, nurses, scientists, entire 
uh, institutions are giving themselves exhaustively, completely, every single day in deep urgency to try to find a cure for something that is causing death. And so it's in light of that reality that we're having to confront, the urgency that we're trying to pursue for a cure, that now we're waiting, waiting for the ecstasy of waking up maybe tomorrow morning and hearing that a cure has been found, the good news that someone somewhere, somehow, has found that this can be cured somehow uh, with a drug or, or some kind of therapy, whatever it is, they now know the cure. We're waiting for that moment. And until then, maybe you've seen this, it's gone viral since it started, but John Krasinski has started the SGN network, the Some Good News. I hope you've watched it, it's been a lot of fun to see. It's a, a network that he's created that he alone shows all the good things that are happening. No bad news allowed, only good news. This morning as we look at Mark chapter 16, we're gonna see that it answers the deeper realities of life that all of us will confront. And it gives us the best news this world has ever heard. And so let's together uh, look at Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, and hear the reading of God's Word. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, mother, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, would you open the eyes of our hearts to see the glory of your risen Son, our risen King. And would you open the ears of our hearts to receive this good news this morning and to know once again that death has been confronted and death has been conquered. Give us the joy of that salvation this morning as we look at your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're heading this morning. And I first want to talk about what they expected as they were heading to the tomb. Then we're going to look at what they actually experienced as they were at the tomb. And then I want to end with three implications of this wonderful message of Easter. Uh, so if you would look with me in the text, we're going to look at first what they expected as they went to the tomb. You can see this in verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. One of the things that they're expecting right off the bat is to find Jesus, but to find the body of Jesus. They're expecting to find him, yes, but they're expecting to find him dead. How do we know that? We know that because they're bringing, in verse 1, spices so that they would anoint him. They expect not only to see his body in the process of death, but they actually expect to, to smell it as well. And, and to anoint him would be to, to cover that up. It would be to honor him, but also to cover up that smell because they expected death. It's so important in the storyline of Scripture to understand that, that patient zero for death is Adam. One of the things that you see in Scripture is it starts with life, abundant life, flourishing life. But then with the fall of Adam into sin, Romans 5 says that by the sin of one man, death 
enters into the world, it begins to say, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and she died, and he died. And it goes on and on. And even the book of Genesis that starts with life ends with the death of Joseph. And so it's not only biblical that the expectation that when someone dies, they're gone. But also in their own personal lives, every time someone that they knew had died, they, they did not expect them to rise from the grave. And yet, at the same time, Jesus in his own ministry had, had told them three times and multiple times alluded to it, hey, when I go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'm going to rise from the grave. So you would expect them to show up on that Sunday morning uh, with kazoos and cakes and candles and all kinds of things for a huge party, maybe bringing Jesus some of his favorite takeout food from who knows where. But they weren't expecting resurrection. They were expecting death. One of the things that's, I think, encouraging for our hearts as we look at these resurrection accounts is the fact that they really do ring true of actual eyewitness testimony. One of the first places that we see that is that it's mentioning the names of very specific women. And in that day and age, a, a woman's testimony was not allowed even in court. And yet here, precisely because it was women who were the first to the grave, they're the ones who were recorded as having seen and experienced just that. If you were just fabricating it, you would have had men be the first ones. And not only that, if you were making it up, sure, if you wanted to attract people to your movement, you would show them about how they were filled with faith and joy and anticipation as they went to the grave, expecting Jesus to be risen and glorious. But it shows how much they were filled with fear and sorrow and doubt. And so it all rings true that what we're hearing and listening to and watching in this text is an actual eyewitness account to what they were expecting and what they actually experienced. So they're expecting to encounter death. They're also expecting to encounter hardship. This is with uh, the stone that needed to be rolled away. You can see this in verse 3. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance to the tomb? They knew to even just get to the body of Jesus, they needed help. But they didn't even know if help would be there. And so that's what they were expecting as they were heading towards the tomb of death and hardship. Even in the midst of their own sorrow, confusion, doubts, fears, but they experience something totally different than what they expected. And that's why Easter morning is so joyful, so good for us to hear once again this eyewitness testimony and account. So we go from what they expected now to what they actually experienced. And the first thing they experienced here, you can see, is a messenger. If you will look with me down in the text, it says in verse 5, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. Notice all the detail. Again, this is giving us a hint. This is eyewitness testimony. Sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. We learn from the other gospel accounts that this is an angel that has shown up. And anytime God does something big and important, moving his purpose forward, Angels are present. Angel is present here. An angel was present at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Angels were present at Jesus' birth. And now they're present here because God has done something new. So what they experience is a messenger, but even more important than that is his message. I would say first it's a declaration. Notice what he says. He says in verse 6, He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Here's the good news. This is the good news and anything on the SGN or anything that you've ever heard. He's going to declare that this sin that has a 100% mortality rate has been cured. Notice what he says. He says, he has risen. 
He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So he's declaring the good news that Jesus has risen from the grave. I love it that Peter, when he's preaching in the book of Acts, it says that death could not contain him. That he had entered into the grave. The messenger says he's risen. It's the declaration of the best news this world has ever heard. That death has not only in the death of Christ been confronted, but in the resurrection, death has been conquered. It is now a conquered enemy. And so that's the declaration that the messenger gives. But he also, notice, gives a very important invitation to anyone and everyone who has ever failed, who has ever fallen, who has ever sinned. Notice what he says. He says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. All the disciples failed and fled, but Peter uniquely was the one who had fallen so far. Go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. It's almost as if it's the one in poster, not of the old Westerns that was wanted dead or alive. It was the one in poster that you would see on the side of a milk carton. Have you seen this person? Because the family so wants to have that child back. When the angel gives this invitation saying, go tell them, the disciples and Peter, that he's coming. It's not for justice. It's not for condemnation. It's for mercy, compassion, and restoration of those who had failed and fallen so far. So that's what they were expecting. That's what they experienced now, this, this declaration, this invitation. It's strange at the end. It says that they were trembling and astonishment that it seized them. They said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. Why is that? It's because God had done something so new. They didn't know quite yet what to do until they met a little bit later on the risen king and he explains it all. But life had conquered death. I want to end by speaking very personally to you of three implications of these things. They went to the tomb expecting death and hardship. Instead, going to the tomb, they experience a messenger with a message of a declaration that death has been confronted and conquered, and the invitation for those who have fallen and failed to be restored to the risen King by His grace alone. And the first thing I would say is this is a moment for a decision for salvation. When Peter is preaching in the book of Acts, he mentions Christ's death for sinners, for our sin. He mentions Christ's resurrection and then everybody says, what do we do? And he says this. He says we should do two things. Repent. And that means to turn from living in our own power and for our own purposes. Repent of our sin and turn to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The declaration of Easter is that our sins have been paid for in full. The resurrection is the perfect receipt of that. And now if we receive the Christ and the fullness of all he's done, we too can be rescued from sin and death. Scripture says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, today is the day to make a decision for salvation. It also gives us a sense of the urgency of our mission. I can't tell you so many friends rightly called me when everything was starting to happen with COVID around the world and saying, Clay, there's something dangerous that's going on. There's something destructive and it's spreading everywhere. I can't even begin to describe what it's capable of doing. And then also, I'm sure the urgency, once a cure comes along, not only to be excited yourself, but to tell everybody you know a cure has been found. And if we have been urgent in our mission and sharing about the dangers of COVID-19 and sharing the encouragement that hopefully soon a cure will be found, how much more 
should we be urgent in our mission to tell others the danger of the sin inside our own hearts and theirs and the fact that a cure has been found alone in the person and work of Christ. It's a moment for a decision for salvation. It reminds us of the urgency of our mission as believers. And lastly, it gives us a comforting conviction whenever we have to face, whenever I have to face, whenever you have to face your own mortality. Let me mention this. I was a friend of a woman by the name of Alice uh, who had been diagnosed with cancer that she knew and we all knew would eventually take her life. She fought it as hard and as faithfully as she could, but one day I got a phone call asking if I could come see her. Some of her friends had called me. I went to her home. She was one of the most kind of gospel-centric, spunky, lively people you've ever met. And she said, Clay, you're here because you think I'm dying. And I looked at her and I said, Alice, I'm here because I know you're dying. And we need to have a serious conversation about what's ahead for you. And with no hesitation, she reached out, she grabbed my arm and she said, Clay, let me tell you something. If Jesus opens that door for me tonight, when I go to bed, you better believe I'm going to go right through it. And then when people come to my funeral, what you can do is you can hand them a Snickers and tell them they can just go home because I'm not there. I'm with Jesus. And three days later, I was doing her funeral. And I took a Snickers and held it up from the pulpit and said, she's not here. She's with her risen king. She could look death in the face and say, bring it on. Because she knew that death was a defeated foe. Because Christ, her king, had confronted it in his own death and conquered it in his resurrection. Christ the Lord is risen indeed. This is 1 Corinthians 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. Let me pray. Father, would you this morning help us see our risen King by faith, to experience his presence by the Spirit, knowing that by faith in him we are risen to newness of life, that you would give us a sense of our urgency of the mission that you've given to us, and that we would have the comforting conviction that when the day comes where we ourselves shall face death, we will know that our King confronted it and conquered it, so that its sting is gone. We long for the day where death shall be no more and life shall reign eternal. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us to celebrate Easter morning where we celebrate that Christ was risen from the grave. If you ever have questions about the gospel, about Christ, or the testimony of the good news of the gospel, please, we encourage you to get in touch with me or with Morgan. Our information is on the website. And as you go, in light of Christ's death and resurrection, receive God's good word, his benediction upon you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.